All right, hello everybody, welcome. We're gonna go ahead and get started. So welcome to the American Head and Neck Society and Head and Neck Cancer Alliance Tobacco Cessation Strategies for Head and Neck Cancer Patients and Survivors webinar. I'm Dr. Heather Edwards. I'm the Director of Head and Neck Surgery at Boston Medical Center and Boston University. And I'd like to start off by thanking our panelists today, Dr. Samir Karawala, Amy Perkle, and Head and Neck Cancer Survivor, Mickey Morris, for taking part in our webinar discussion today. So for today's webinar, we have our three panelists who are going to present, and then following their presentations, we will be opening everything up to the audience for questions. Um, but you can feel free to ask questions throughout, either in the Q&A section or by the chat function. Keep in mind that the Q&A only goes to the, um, the panelists and the rest of the team here, and the chat function is seen by everybody participating today, so including all the other attendees. All right. So to begin, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Mickey Morris, who is a survivor of laryngeal cancer from Greenfield, Indiana. So Mickey was diagnosed with laryngeal cancer in 2019 and underwent both chemotherapy and radiation treatment. Since her diagnosis four years ago, Mickey has been tobacco free. Um, so before that, she successfully and unsuccessfully attempted to quit smoking for 20 years. She tried nicotine patches, gum, lozenges, and all types of homeopathic approaches, including hypnotherapy twice. Um, she started keeping a journal, which um, she felt helped her because of the emotional component of addiction. Um, and she noted that journaling helped her to quit judging herself as a smoker, which I thought was very insightful. And she finally switched to vaping before she finally quit the day of her cancer diagnosis. We are so pleased to have Mickey with us today to tell us a little bit more about her journey in smoking cessation. So take it away, Mickey. Thank you very much. Um, I tried to quit smoking probably for at least 20 years. Anything that came down the road that sounded plausible, and even if it didn't sound plausible, I was perfectly willing to try it. Um, I never gave up hope. Um, every cigarette brings guilt with it, which a lot of non-smokers really don't understand. We smokers feel really guilty about it. That was one of my uh, biggest things that, that made me want to quit, but I had a, um, I'd have a knee replacement and I live alone. And um, a knee replacement means I couldn't move. I've never smoked a cigarette in my home. Let me make that clear right up front. Never done that. So I'm thinking, what am I going to do now? I have my knee replaced and I can't, I can't get outside to smoke a cigarette. That was a very good way for me to take a real good look at how serious the situation was. I started, and I know it, it's frowned upon, but sometimes... Uh, the means get you to the end, okay? I started vaping. Why I vaped, I also used other nicotine replacement to get through. Well, you know what? I quit smoking cigarettes. <laughs> By the time um, I had my knee replacement, I didn't have to go outside to smoke a cigarette because I wasn't smoking cigarettes any longer. I was vaping. I had cut all the nicotine out of the vaping to where it was simply a, um, how do I say? It was simply an oral stimulation that I needed. I, I physically and mentally needed that. That's what I was getting from it. So I did that until I had a doctor's appointment. I had this little bitty knot on my throat, right here. Little bitty knot, I didn't think it was anything. And um, I'm kind of a thorough person, so I always kept a note because I only went to the doctor maybe once a year. And I kept a note of things. And when I went in to see him, keep in mind, this was not even my doctor. My doctor was on maternity leave. And I showed him this little bitty knot right here. And I said, this is kind of crazy. It just came out of nowhere. He was very young. And he decided to send me. Um, he had all kinds of appointments lined up for me. And I thought, oh, God, he's just a young kid. What's he know? He saved my life. I sent him a thank you because of his thoroughness, they discovered that I had laryngeal cancer. I then went to a wonderful doctor and 
liking your doctors is so important at this point. Um, I still didn't know I had cancer. I just thought I had a lo little lump right there on my neck. Went to my doctor and um, met Dr. Moore for the first time. And he told me I had cancer. And um, <laughs> what I said, I remember my words to him and he will laugh when I say this because I'm sure he's listening. I said to him, are you telling me that I'm gonna die in some dirty little hotel or a dirty little hospital room with yellow plastic curtains and a bed by myself? <laughs> And he said, did you just say that? And I said, I think I did. I don't, and I'm crying. And I'm like, I don't know where that came from. And he said, um, no, but you and I are going to be spending a lot of years together. And those were such comforting words. So when I walked out of his office, I stopped at the first garbage can. I threw away the vape. Now, keep in mind, we're not talking some cheap 99 cent vape. <laughs> I probably had $120 worth of goods I threw into the first garbage can. I have never looked back. I have never vaped again. But keep in mind, for all you people that want to quit smoking, even after all this time, that was back in 2019, I'll have a good supper. And a great cup of coffee. I'm a coffee snob, okay? A great cup of coffee. And I'm sitting there drinking that coffee and I'm thinking, ah, oh, damn, a cigarette would sure taste good about now. Don't think it ever goes away for good because it does. But I've never given in. And I've just laughed at myself when I have that moment. I just kind of chuckle. And I go on because I wouldn't go back for anything. So can it be done? I'm living proof it can be done. I was a to hide in the wool smoker people. It can be done. Thank you for listening to me. That was fantastic, Mickey. Thank you so much for sharing that and for those inspiring words to finish, us up, finish it off. Um, to tell us a little bit more about maybe the evidence behind how it can be done, I'd like to uh, go ahead and introduce Dr. Samir Karawala. So Dr. Karawala is uh, the professor and chair of the Department of Otolaryngology Head and Neck Surgery at the University of Minnesota. His NIH funded research is focused on tobacco related carcinogenesis in oral and head and neck cancer. And his work pertains to product analyses, the identification of oral signatures indicating cancer risk, as well as the development of strategies for both prevention and early detection of tobacco-induced tumors. So we are very excited to have Dr. Carol Walla here today to share some of his enormous expertise on this topic. Take it away, Dr. Carol Walla. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. Thank you, Mickey, for sharing your story. And thank you, uh, all those who are in attendance uh, for your interest. I'm really happy to be here to talk about this. This is something I'm very passionate about. And uh, so I really appreciate the invitation to speak about it. Um, let's see if I can get my slides to advance. Okay, there we go. Uh, so just a little bit of history. Um, cigarette smoking, um, you know, steadily increased in the, the first half of the 1900s to really epic proportions. Um, and the tide didn't start turning until the little bit of data came out. And this is a historical paper uh, from 1952 from some epidemiologist, Dahl and Hill, uh, who since become well known for this sort of seminal work that started to note that ever since cigarette smoking had kind of taken off, well, in a delayed fashion, lung cancer was taking off as well. And this epidemic of lung, epidemic of lung cancer had never been seen before. So these articles, they did a few, published a few papers about this. And then uh, the Surgeon General of the United States uh, tasked, created a task force to study this and wrote a report in 1964. Um, and this was a big deal at the time. They did it on a Saturday to minimize the impact on the financial markets, uh, but also so that it would hit the Sunday newspapers, which was a big deal at the time, and still sort of is. Uh, but they locked the doors and, and kind of talked about um, you know, what they found, which was a significant association between the use of cigarettes and lung cancer. Um, so based on that and, and several steps afterwards, uh, tobacco use decreased in the second half of the 20th century. But still at that point, there are 1.2 billion smokers worldwide, 46 million smokers in the US, and about 20% of Americans classify themselves as smokers. So it's still a big problem. But over time, 
the uh, legislation and the media and the attention that has come around smoking led to a decrease in smoking. And that's what you're seeing in the black line here. So starting in the mid 60s, you can kind of see that start to taper off. And then the blue and the red line are lung cancer rates, blue for men, red for women. And you start to see those taper off and even decrease, but again, in a delayed fashion because it takes some time for um, the effects to show up or not, not show up as it were as smoking decreased. Um, it's important to note that smoking and the sale of smoking products had become really uh, important to state and federal economics. Uh, the taxes on these products had gone, um, had become a big part of budgets. And so as smoking went down, even with increasing the taxes on these cigarette packs, the revenue that came from uh, the, the, uh, the, the sale of, of cigarettes uh, you know, was in danger. And so what you see here in the bottom right is that as, as smoking was going down at 254 million, uh, they increased the taxes so much that they still were able to uh, generate you know, almost double that in tax revenue. Uh, but you can, you can get the idea, it's inherently problematic if we, uh, you know, our roads and things that are in our infrastructure are dependent on the sale of a dangerous product. So that's required a shift. Now, tobacco contains many, many, many dangerous uh, chemicals. These are a few of them, but there's over 70. Uh, these include nitrosamines, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. This takes us back to you know, chemistry class. Uh, formaldehyde uh, is present in, in tobacco. So really uh, a potpourri of really dangerous things that can cause all kinds of problems. And what happens is, um, and I'm really glad that Mickey spoke to this, smoking initiation and nicotine addiction, of course, is the first step. And that leads to you know, the exposure to carcinogens, uh, which can then be activated that create you know, DNA adducts, which are uh, binding of compounds to DNA. Uh, and when the DNA structure is disrupted, you can get mutations and that can lead to cancer. Uh, but this initiation and nicotine addiction part, um, you know, I used to just kind of implore my patients to quit. Um, and Nikki, uh, Nikki spoke about the shame uh, that smokers feel. And I think that is really sort of prescient uh, topic because what I tell my patients now is we have to remember these products were devised in a lab literally by evil scientists and, and they made them purposefully in a way that it would be almost impossible to quit. They, they worked for years on this to get exactly the right amount of nicotine in their products so that you couldn't quit. So when I, when patients tell me they can't quit, I explain to them that that's there, you, you know, that's how it was designed, unfortunately, and it's not their fault. And there are methods to quit and they work for some people and don't work for others, uh, but that they shouldn't feel ashamed of it because it's somebody else's dastardly work that led to them not being able to quit. And uh, that's just an, um, you know, an unfortunate part of the history of the tobacco industry. Um, so we know that, that tobacco use increases the risk of head and neck cancer you know, uh, by 10 times. Cessation you know, decreases the risk. We don't know if the risk ever really returns to that of a non-smoker. Um, and, and drinking along with tobacco doesn't just add, it synergizes. So your risk is compounded uh, significantly by uh, these two risk factors. Uh, and alcohol, of course, is an independent risk factor alone. So you know, historically, when we consider all cases of head and neck cancer, all new cases, 70 to 80% of them were associated with tobacco and alcohol. That's changing now with, with the HPV epidemic, but tobacco and alcohol still cause a significant amount of head and neck cancer. Um, but after diagnosis, tobacco still continues to harm uh, those who continue to smoke. Um, tobacco use during radiation therapy, for example, uh, this is a study uh, from uh, uh, UC Davis where they looked at uh, what happened to those smokers who continued to smoke during radiation therapy. Um, so they kind of compared the smokers who quit with the ones who didn't quit prior to their radiation. And for the active smokers, their five-year survival was 23% uh, with a lower rate of local regional control. When you compare that to people who quit, the former smokers, they quit at the time of their diagnosis, their five-year survival rate was 55% uh, with a control rate of 69% local regionally. There's also a higher incidence of grade three complications. So You've developed a cancer from smoking, but now it's also harming your ability to get cured from the cancer if, if you're not able to quit. Uh, there are a lot of hypotheses as to why this might be. Uh, smoking contributes to chronic hypoxia, uh, decreased oxygenation, and, and radiation really is dependent on oxygenation to work because it requires generation of what we call free radicals. 
Uh, smoking may also cause upregulation of EGFR, which is often uh, an important receptor in head and neck cancers, and also uh, elevate the levels of carboxyhemoglobin in, in the bloodstream of smokers. So the higher levels of radiation are required to achieve the same amount of uh, radicalization of oncogenes. For those patients who are having surgery, smoking also causes uh, or, or imparts an increased risk of complications. Uh, many times patients need reconstructive surgery. This is a study looking at patients getting reconstruction. And this is a really busy slide, but if you look in the bottom row where it says serum cotinine concentration, cotinine is a marker of, of, of nicotine uh, dose. So we can measure how much someone's smoking by looking at their cotinine levels. And those who had lower cotinine levels, you can see the less than 10 group, uh, about 26% of them had a wound complication. Uh, but those who had greater than 10 nanograms of cotinine had a much higher rate of wound complications. Um, so smoking makes it harder to heal. There's also a risk for second tumors. Um, when uh, a study was performed looking at a case control study of 515, 514 patients with head and neck cancer and kind of followed them after their initial diagnosis, uh, the increased risk for a second tumor in these smokers um, was 2.9 times higher, almost three times. And when you add in alcohol, it becomes five times higher. And again, you know, it's uh, lay people, even physicians may ask, why would someone continue to smoke after a diagnosis of head and neck cancer? Well, there are risk factors for this. So some of the things that are associated with lower levels of persistent smoking include higher education, living with a spouse or partner who can help support the smoker and try to help them quit, uh, advanced stage, laryngeal subsite, and those who get combined therapy with surgery or chemo and radiation are more likely to quit. But as we learn more and more about the marginalized folks in our society, uh, we understand that those who maybe don't have the financial background or the educational background, it's much harder for them to quit uh, given a variety of life circumstances. Um, so, so tobacco doesn't just cause cancer. Uh, we know it does, it contributes to carcinogenesis, but it creates a risk for tumor persistence. It decreases the efficacy of radiation therapy. It causes wound complications during free tissue surgery and, and it also puts uh, smokers at risk for a second tumor. Um, so Mickey also touched on this and I'm really glad that you did. Um, I wanted to talk a little about uh, um, e-cigarettes or electronic nic nicotine delivery devices because there's so much information out there and I want to try to provide a little bit of clarity. Uh, and of course, I'll pepper it with my own opinions uh, about this. Uh, so um, e-cigarettes are these uh, sort of electronic devices that are made of several you know, parts. There's a mouthpiece that uh, collects and delivers vapor. There's a little cartridge that holds the liquid. These, you might uh, hear these referred to as e-liquids. So every one of them has a special uh, liquid that sometimes is flavored. Uh, there's an atomizer that heats the liquid. And there's a little sensor here that activates a microprocessor that controls the atomizer. And of course, you need the light at the end so that everybody knows you're smoking or vaping, kind of pseudo smoking. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but there's also a battery in there. So um, this has become a massive industry, okay? In uh, the US dollars, these are in billions. In 2015, $3.52 billion industry. And look where we are in 2022 and 2023, and these are projected numbers. Uh, but multiple, this is you know not even double. This is tripled and, and quadrupled uh, over the last few years, in terms of billions of dollars that are uh, being spent on these products. They were pat patented in 2004, and like Mickey sort of alluded to, they they mimic the look and feel of cigarettes. So they address that oral fixation, but they also mimic the behavior of smoking. Uh, they create a smoke-free vapor that may or may not have nicotine in it. And what's really concerning is that use among high school students, which was 1.5% uh, in 2011, jumped to 16% in 2015. And I suspect it's even higher now. Um, if anybody has teenagers, uh, I suspect you've heard them talk about kids. When I was growing up, you used to talk about smoking in the bathroom. Now kids talk about vaping in the bathroom. And it's, it's uh, rampant in not only high schools, but middle schools as well. Um, and 81% of youth users cite the appealing flavors. Um, I think that number is low of 4% of adults are daily users, uh, but uh, it's certainly a large percentage of folks. And again, you know, the tobacco companies continue in this sort of behavior of really targeting youth, just like they did with cigarettes. So they make these bright colors, 
tasty flavors, strawberry, banana, all, you know, all kinds of things that are going to appeal to children uh, because they know uh, that they need to get people hooked young to make more money. Um, so in, in August of 2016, uh, the FDA was given uh, the ability to regulate all tobacco products. So they, they made it legal to sell to folks under 18, you know, vending machines. Um, and this kind of this law, the Family Smoking and Prevention Act provided a foundation for future regulation. But there currently is no approved indication for e-cigarettes in cessation. But as Mickey alluded to, many do use them as a cessation tool and many are successful. Um, 50% of smokers who are motivated to quit have tried e-cigarettes. And again, this is different than a traditional nicotine replacement because it replicates both the pharmacologic part of it, it gives you the nicotine, and the behavioral or the oral aspect of smoking. Um, now, what's in that e-liquid? Uh, they generally uh, contain a, a compound called propylene glycol. Uh, this is a clear colorless liquid. It has varying particle sizes. We know it's safe in cosmetics, but it's never been studied in long-term inhalation. And that's what we don't know. Um, now, you might have heard of ethylene glycol, which is antifreeze uh, that you put in your car. Uh, and diethylene glycol has been found in e-cigarettes. So let's remember, these aren't you know, exactly well-regulated. And what's in some of these things, um, we just don't know. Uh, but there have been some dangerous compounds found inside them. And the way to think about this, I think, is that just like when smoking started really taking off, cigarette smoking started taking off in the early 1900s, nobody knew the long-term effects of what this would be. Everybody thought it was just kind of a social thing, a cool thing to do. And then later we started to see this uh, epidemic of lung cancer. So what epidemic might we see um, related to e-cigarette use? We don't know. Um, it may not be lung cancer, it might be something else. Um, but it just hasn't been studied yet, and we don't have enough data or, or time to see the long-term effects of using these things. Um, so one thing I will say, um, in, and I'll, I'll, say this, I'll say this on another slide, the only folks who I think really should be considering the use of electronic cigarettes are people like Mickey, who are smoking, want to quit, and can't. That's the only time an e-cigarette is probably valuable. Um, and the reason is that they have fewer known carcinogenic compounds. So they, they reduce the number of tobacco-related carcinogens um, and therefore lower the potential disease burden that's associated with traditional smoking. Now, this is a really small uh, table, and I just want to highlight the area at the top there. So one hop is this thing you see on the left, and NNAL is another uh, compound. So both of these are cancer-causing chemicals that are seen in, um, in the, that are, uh, smokers are exposed to. And in that first column, you can see the levels of uh, one hop and NNAL, which are pretty low. And then if you look in the middle and third columns, they're much higher, two to three times higher of the uh, one hop and you know, hundreds of times higher of the NNAL in cigarette users. So the first column is e-cigarettes and the second and third columns are cigarette smokers. So we know that in terms of the traditionally studied tobacco related carcinogens, cigarettes, e-cigarettes are actually safer but we don't know what else they might be imparting uh, through the use of propylene glycol and other undefined chemicals. So the other thing to think about is that nicotine itself is not classically considered carcinogenic, but there is some data to suggest otherwise. And, and this is an example where uh, some of my colleagues found uh, another nitrosamine, nitrosamine or nicotine, in the urine of some users of oral nicotine replacement therapy. So there may be some uh, folks who have the intrinsic enzymatic capability of converting nicotine to a, a nitrosamine endogenously inside their body. And so they actually are getting exposed to a carcinogen, even though they're using just plain old nicotine product. So this question, is the electronic cigarette kind of a knight in shining armor? Or is it a Trojan horse? Certainly the data suggests a lower carcinogenic load, like I mentioned, but the products are voluminous and varying in their nature, and we really have to exercise caution. Um, as far as smoking cessation, I just want to touch on this briefly. There are a lot of studies that have examined the efficacy of e-cigarettes in tobacco cessation, and the results are really mixed. Uh, there are stories like Mickey's where people say, this really helped me quit. Um, but when we look at large scale uh, groups of smokers, it's been hard to find an improvement. There may be a little bit of uh, improvement in cessation, 
when comparing e-cigarettes to placebo or counseling alone, but the studies that have been performed are really highly biased and there haven't because of this, there haven't been strong recommendations made because the data is just very low quality. But we certainly hear these anecdotal stories of people who have quit. So the question is, will e-cigarettes make, make this smoking type of behavior acceptable again? It really has become a social stigma to smoke, um, but will it lead young people to try other tobacco products? Um, certainly, uh, the, the cigarette companies need to make up that revenue, and they will do everything that they can uh, for their bottom line. And um, while e-cigarettes can result in some risk reduction in smokers, what I said earlier is there's really no reason for use in anyone else other than a smoker who's trying to quit. The youth uptake is massive and concerning. And essentially what tobacco companies are doing are really substituting one product for another while maintaining or growing their profits. So they don't really care what we buy as long as we buy one of their products. And so they are very happy to go all in on a tobacco-free world as long as folks are buying their e-cigarettes. And that's obviously happening as, as you saw from the um, billions of dollars that are being spent uh, on these products. So that's all I have. Um, I, I think um, you know Mickey's story is really wonderful and wonderful to hear. And it's a great success story. Um, some folks are able to and some are not. Um, but we have to uh, you know, support our patients and also hopefully com uh, counsel them about various smoking cessation methods, uh, and uh, we'll hear a little bit more about that uh, from our, our other speaker, Amy. Um, thank you. I'll stop sharing. Great. Thank you, Dr. Carawalla. That was fascinating, uh, especially all of the information on vaping. That was very interesting. Um, I already have some questions for you, but Let's uh, he learn a little bit more about resources and techniques that are effective in tobacco cessation from Amy Perkle. So um, Amy Perkle is the lead tobacco treatment specialist at Stanford Healthcare Tobacco Treatment Services. She received her certification as a tobacco treatment specialist and her motivational interview training at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. She also holds a Bachelor of Psychology degree and will be graduating with her Master's in Social Work degree in June of this year. Um, she is a tobacco treatment specialist with over 10 years of experience helping patients to quit tobacco use. She provides tobacco counseling services to patients while also addressing their psycho, uh, psychosocial needs and problem solving skills. Prior to her role at Stanford Healthcare, Amy joined the University of Minnesota NCI funded Cancer Moonshot Initiative, where she provided program development and implementation of a clinical tobacco program in cancer care. We are so delighted to have Amy here today to talk about resources and techniques that are effective in tobacco cessation. So take it away, Amy. Thank you so much. So as Dr. Kariwala has explained some of the um, behind the scenes kind of medical stuff related to tobacco use, um, I wanted to kind of share a bit more about what is tobacco treatment and some various strategies um, that can help everyone to be successful. So with um, tobacco treatment, um, tobacco treatment is certainly becoming a vital component to cancer care. And the Cancer Moonshot Initiative is really kind of recognized that with the National Cancer Institute. Um, they have provided funding for various national or NCI funded cancer centers. Um, so there's different C2A sites here that have received the Cancer Center Cessation Initiative grant funding. Um, there's 50 plus sites all over the country. So if you are a patient at one of those, um, it's more than likely that there is a program that will be able to provide some free services um, to help you quit smoking. Here at Stanford, uh, we are part of cohort two um, who have received some funding and have spread that out over three cancer center sites um, that we provide cancer care to. Um, so we have screened 99% of our patients that are seen and we do outreach by phone and have reached 71% of those patients to offer them some services. 37% um, have engaged in at least one treatment. And we do follow up at the six month and 24 month mark. Um, and as you can see here, we have 28 to 29% uh, success rates with that. So, um, so tobacco cessation is really kind of two parts. 
it's, it's physiological and also behavioral. So we need to address both um, to really be successful. So the physiological part is really that addiction to nicotine. It's where that nicotine is filling those nicotine receptors. And we would have some medications for that cessation piece of things. Um, behavioral is really the habit of smoking. What is the habit of using tobacco? So therefore, we do have some behavioral change programs that really address kind of your day-to-day -day stuff. What are those triggers and cues to smoke? So treatment should really address the physiological and the behavioral aspects of dependence. But why is it so hard to quit? Well, as I said, the behavioral part is the habit of smoking. Most patients start smoking around the age 13, 14, 15, and it's really something that you've probably done for a really long time. And it's just something you maybe can't see life without. It's hard to imagine your daily routine, not including smoking. Um, but the physiological piece as well is really tough. The withdrawal symptoms can be really uncomfortable. In the first three to five days, you're gonna have really intense urges to, and cravings to smoke. You might notice some changes in mood, such as irritability, anxiety, depression. You're gonna feel more hungry, trouble sleeping, maybe having a hard time concentrating, or some more common ones, headaches and increased coughing. But the benefits really start almost immediately. Within the first 20 minutes, your blood pressure drops back down to normal. Um, after eight hours, your oxygen levels are increasing. 48 hours, your sense of taste and smell. 72 hours, um, you're, you're gonna breathe a little bit better. And also at that 72 hour mark, your body has kind of metabolized the nicotine. So your body is kind of free of nicotine at that point. Um, and so on. So we do see kind of more benefits as time goes on. So how do we address the physiological? Um, we do have some tobacco medication options. Um, most commonly, you might have seen kind of those over-the-counter options, the patch, gum, or lozenge. And those, of course, come in different doses, depending on how much tobacco you're using at that time. Um, the prescription options, one I kind of want to highlight due to the discussion about e-cigarettes, is the nicotine inhaler or nicotrol inhaler um, is what it's called. So in that right-hand corner, um, you see that little kind of puffer thing and you kind of insert a cartridge, but there's no heating element in there. So it's really just kind of inhaling some of the vapors or you know, the nicotine liquid from that cartridge. And then the lining of your mouth absorbs that nicotine in your bloodstream. So a lot of patients like that option um, as a way to kind of um, help with the having something in your hand or the oral fixation, um, but there's other options as well, the nasal spray, um, and then the oral medications, bupropion and varenicline um, or Chantix. So here at Stanford, we have some behavioral counseling options. Um, there's individual or family sessions currently done by Zoom or over the phone. These sessions can really help to build your uh, motivation help you to develop a personalized treatment plan that's for you and your lifestyle, um, different coping skills, support and education. You're gonna have a medication treatment plan and then also support for family and household members who use tobacco. Um, we do also provide group counseling. So they be together with kind of like-minded people who are also in the middle of trying to quit, which is great for some accountability and support. You're gonna hear some different strategies and tips to quit from others who are also in it. Um, and they might have some unique um, strategies as well. And then of course the quit line might be some over the phone counseling sessions, um, some other support and education. One new kind of approach to quitting smoking is the MindCateen app. So this is kind of a virtual reality option. Um, it uses an app on your phone and you would get kind of a headset that you would place your phone in and kind of experience a virtual reality like experience that uses cognitive behavioral therapy, um, different coaching strategies, and then the app itself can help to track your tobacco use, um, self-help handbook with tips, a chat room, and some calculators to kind of determine how much money you're saving. So these 10 minute videos are something that can help guide you through some common situations to help you manage those moments where you're more likely to smoke. So some stressful, successful strategies to quit. 
I would say to choose your quit date and really prepare for that date, knowing kind of, you know, your triggers, your cues, you're maybe going to seek some support through some tobacco treatment services. Having that plan, knowing what your triggers are to avoid, um, and the, especially the first few days um, to avoid smoking, consider some medication support. Uh, telling your friends and family, kind of getting them all on board as well, and having them kind of prepare with you. You're going to maybe track your use. As Mickey mentioned, having some like a journal to really track, maybe it's your tobacco use, or track how you're feeling can really be helpful. It, it also gives you something to look back at maybe a year or so later and wonder, wow, look at how far that I've come. So keeping busy for the first three to five days, spend some time in the tobacco-free spaces, maybe create some tobacco-free spaces. If you smoke in your house, maybe remove all tobacco from, from the home or maybe having a tobacco-free room that you can spend time in, maybe be with other non-tobacco users. Um, get up and go for a walk if you're able. Um, that is something that can distract you from that thought or cue to smoke. Maybe enjoy some other hobbies and remove tobacco and all products like lighters or ashtrays. And last but not least, celebrate your success. You're doing some hard work and it's great to kind of pat yourself on the back and realize how far you've come. That was wonderful. Thank you, Amy. Um, so at this point, we would like to open things up to any questions. You can put your questions um, either in the chat or in the Q&A. And while we are um, giving the, all of the attendees a chance to throw in some questions, I'd like to start us off with a first question for Mickey. Mickey, if someone is on the line today and they are a smoker and they're feeling ready to quit, what would you tell them today? What would you tell them their first step should be or um, what would you say to that person? You may be muted. Unmute, am I good? There we go. Um, the first thing I would say, um, get a journal. Start writing down everything you feel. Good, bad. It's your personal journal. Write anything in it you want. So to me, that would be step one. And that step's going to take you to step two. That's great. That sounds like fantastic advice. Um, to follow that, you know, one thing that really stood out to me about um, Mickey's story was this use of hypnotherapy. And I've had a few patients over the years mention to me that they've tried that. Um, Amy or Dr. Carol Walla, do either of you have any experience with that or have any thoughts about whether that is an effective um, treatment strategy? I know it didn't work for Mickey, but is it something that it's worth patients trying? Yeah, I've definitely had several patients over the years who have really found a lot of success with a hypnosis to quit. Um, I had one patient in particular, she received some cassette tapes, I guess, back in the day, if you want to think of that, um, that she did and had a lot of success with. And she kind of pulled in uh, to using uh, re more recently, she always referred back to her tapes um, that were used during her hypnosis session. So um, there are some research out there that do support the use of hypnosis to quit smoking. Um, although it's not kind of our first line approach, it is something that a lot of patients actually do find successful. So you know, I tell my patients, if it works for you, awesome. I'm not gonna detract from something that might help you. That makes sense to me. I would say the same. I, I, I've had a few patients who maybe mentioned it, but um, I would never discourage anyone from trying something. Um, again, I mean, the benefits are, there's no harm in trying, and uh, if it works, it's great. If it doesn't, we'll try something else. Great. Um, from the chat, someone is asking, um, wondering if anyone can have access to mind content, or is it still fairly new and hard to get? 
Um, here at Stanford, we're piloting that project. So we are kind of using it as a research study to determine the interest um, in mind catching so far. So we are working with that um, company or app to provide some kits for patients. Um, so I'm not quite sure if it's super open to the public quite yet. I think it's still kind of in development just to see the interest in it, at least from our point here at Stanford as we're studying that. So good question. Great, thank you. Um, another question from the chat, what medications for smoking cessation do you prefer, or maybe um, what would be like a first line to, to prescribe or recommend? Uh, I usually, you know, I, I recommend all kinds of things to patients, whether it's a nicotine patch or a nicotine gum. Um, there are some patients that use varenicline or Chantix, and uh, it's like a switch gets shut off and they don't want to smoke anymore the first time they take it, and there are others who it doesn't help at all. Uh, but again, I think it's worth a shot. Um, and you know, the, the people that it works for are sort of astounded uh, with how they suddenly don't want to smoke anymore. Um, but it's perplexing that for others, it does nothing. So uh, those are the things that I usually talk to my patients about. Okay, and I'll kind of piggyback on that. Um, you know, some patients have actually tried varenicline as well, the Chantix, um, and some of the side effects um, are not something that they really enjoy. They might have some more vivid dreams or nausea. And so some of those more common side effects might be kind of unpleasant for some patients. And the use of combination therapy with the patch plus the gum or the lozenge might be a better, uh, more appropriate option. So it we know that these medications are safe and effective. Um, it's really kind of just personal preference as to what might work best for you, so. Great, that makes sense. Um, I have another question for Dr. Carol Walla. Um, a lot of patients ask about marijuana. Is this worse than cigarettes? Is it better? Is it okay if I keep smoking marijuana? How does that compare? What do you usually tell patients with those types of questions? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I think the epidemiologic data suggests uh, that marijuana does not have as nearly or any clear association with head and neck cancer, probably because people can't smoke as much of it as they, or don't typically smoke as much of it as they do a cigarette where you can smoke two packs a day of cigarettes, you know. Uh, so the carcinogen burden to some degree may still be there, but it's not as high uh, because you're just not consuming as much. Um, so I don't, um, you know, I don't encourage my patients to smoke marijuana, but I don't actively discourage them either. Um, I don't feel that, you know, the literature supports that as a major risk factor for, for head and neck cancer or lung cancer. Great, thank you. Um, another question from the chat about any specific resources that you um, would recommend for all of your patients to smoke, or, or maybe what would be the first resource or the first thing that you would recommend that a provider say to their patient who is interested in quitting? Go ahead, Amy, if you have a, uh, I'm happy to answer too, but go ahead. Okay. I would say, you know, as a tobacco treatment specialist, you know, maybe talking to a provider is you know, really to encourage your patient to quit smoking and to really state how important it is to you, like maybe as an oncologist, um, that it is important to their cancer care. I've had many patients tell me, well, I'm not sure that my, my doctor even cares that I quit. Um, trust me, they do. <laughs> and it's very important, um, but they do care. Um, but I wish that they would kind of reiterate that um, to their patients a bit more, so. Yeah, I think um, I've become more cognizant again of sort of walking that line between making sure I don't shame them, but also it does need to be said, uh, you know, so that patients don't think my doctor doesn't care because we definitely don't want that to be the takeaway uh, from a visit. Um, but in terms of resources, uh, you know, uh, facilities like uh, Amy mentioned, you know, tobacco cessation clinics or programs that may exist in institutions are a great place to start. If you don't have something like that, hopefully there's something nearby or at a nearby institution. Uh, otherwise, start by, you know, uh, a patch is very easy to prescribe uh, as, as sort of a starting, um, you know, a starting um, intervention. Great. 
Another question from the chat, um, does insurance usually cover behavioral counseling for smoking? Um, I'm guessing, Amy, would you know the answer to that? That is a great question. And I think that really all depends on where you're maybe getting the behavioral counseling for smoking. Um, some of the cancer centers that have received funding, like I mentioned, are maybe providing some free services uh, through that grant funding. Um, I know as that kind of wraps up, uh, most of the cancer centers are looking for sustainable ways to kind of maintain their services. So there might be some charges. Um, in that case, you know, sometimes going through that quit line might be a more appropriate avenue um, if you're not able to afford any sort of those counseling options. So um, I would say that that's another resource that can be used for um, cost savings. Great. Bringing it back to um, providers for a second, because I think we have a number of providers in different roles on the line. Um, Mickey, I'm sure in the course of your, your journey to quitting smoking, you probably had a number of conversations with doctors and different health providers. Do you have any thoughts about what care providers might have said to you that was helpful or conversely things that maybe weren't helpful approaches or techniques that, that your doctors or care providers might have taken over the years? Thank you. That's a very good question. Um, yes, my main, uh, my head, neck, and throat cancer doctor, he was very assuring. As I said in my introduction, he was very assuring. But along the other line, um, I had 40 bouts of radiation. And every single time I met with that doctor, he asked me, now, are you smoking? And I had worked so hard to not be smoking. So every time he asked me that, there was just this little barometer inside my brain that went, oh, you know, and I finally said to him, you know, doc, I tell you every single week or every time, I'm sorry, I didn't meet with him every week. I tell you every time I meet with you that I no longer smoke and how proud I am of that. And you keep asking me over and over. And you know what he said to me? He said, you won't believe the amount of people that do go back to smoking. I thought that was very sad. That was a very sad thing. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Good, good tip to all those providers out there to celebrate the wins, I think. Um, all right, so I think that that is it for uh, questions in the chat at this point. So I think uh, we can probably go ahead and wrap things up. I want to thank um, Mickey, our survivor. I'd like to thank all of our survivors and their caregivers, as well as their care providers for your attendance at our session today. A special thanks to our panelists, Dr. Carol Walla, Amy Perkle, and Mickey, as well as the Head and Neck Cancer Alliance and the American Head and Neck Society for their time in organizing and hosting this webinar. So thank you everyone and have a great evening. Thank you, have a great evening.